Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hargrick coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are continuing our study of Matthew 24, often called the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Olivet, because he is on the Mount of Olives. Discourse, because he's discoursing. Um, and it involves, they're, they're showing him all the buildings of the temple as if to go, ooh, ah, look at what we did. And of course, Jesus, not impressed, he departed from the temple already. And then he turned around and he said, I tell you that there's coming a time when not one stone is going to be left on another here. And of course, you know, the Jews were going... Not only is he not impressed, he's saying all this is going to be torn down. Surely it's not so. This is God's house. God wouldn't let that happen. Of course God's going to let it happen. God was not in that temple. Uh, we talked about that the last time. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. So now his disciples are going, did he just say that? Did he just say this temple is going to be? Lord, tell us when these things are going to be. And so we pick it up in um, verse uh, 3 of Matthew 24. Tell us when these things shall be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. Because they figured, you know, this surely this is going to be in the end of the world. Now we know historically, again, we talked about this last week. In AD 70, the Romans uh, encompassed Jerusalem, besieged Jerusalem. And when they finally broke through after a few months, they literally destroyed that entire temple, burnt whatever was burned down to the ground and took stone. To this day, there are stones laying there as a memorial to the fact what the Roman soldiers did. However, there's still a remnant of a wall left signifying to those who actually believe every word that Jesus said. If Jesus said, not one stone shall be left on another, if there are still stones left on another, then we know that that prophecy has not yet been perfectly fulfilled the way God does things. And so that wailing wall, I believe, is coming down one of these days. But the disciples wanted to know when, well, okay, what's going to be the deal here? How is this going to turn out? What's going to be the sign that these things happen. So let's pick it up in verse four. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. Great point. And how many times is that in the Bible where God is telling us, don't let, don't let people deceive you. Don't let people lie to you. Don't believe, don't believe fake news. I mean, surely Jesus foresaw 2000 years ago, the internet, when he said, take heed that no man deceive you, right? Anyway, uh, so he says, take heed that no man deceive you. Verse five, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And we talked about the I am Christ part last week. So we're going to move forward. We're going to talk about uh, eventually, and I've got some things to go before that. We're going to talk about the wars and the rumors of wars. But there's an interesting statement that he said here, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. Now, how many times is that in the Bible? Number one, where Jesus tells us, do not be deceived, multiple times throughout the scriptures. Then he also tells us, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be in fear. Don't let people scare you. Don't operate in fear. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And he says, see that you be not troubled. Now, just as a matter of life, my heart and the, and the older I get, the weaker I get. And I worry about things. My heart does get troubled. It's not a sin. I'm not trying to willingly disobey God. It's just the fact that I'm not near as strong 
as I used to be, especially when it comes to strength, intestinal fortitude, bravery, courage, things like that. I mean, when I was young, I wanted to join the military. Would have died for my country. Now, yeah, wait a minute, they're going to shoot bullets? Really? So, I mean, the older I get, the more fearful I get. But what I believe, what I absolutely am convinced of, that if there comes such a time as something makes me afraid and yet God says, I don't want Mike afraid. I believe God will not allow me to be afraid. That's what I believe. In other words, I don't have this thing of courage all bundled up inside of me waiting to explode out. What I have is a lot of weakness, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. I've talked about that openly before. The older I get, it just seems like I get more depressed. I get more worried about things, anxious. But I believe that if God comes over me and God doesn't want me afraid, I won't be afraid. And see, then I'll know that it wasn't me because it's not in me. I'll know it was God who did it. Okay? So he says, um, um, Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled. And we'll talk about that. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now that stood out to me. The end is not yet. So I decided to do a little bit more digging into that statement, particularly two words, the end. One of the things that God taught me about this beloved, beautiful, ordered, very perfect King James Bible is that if you find a phrase like that, take a chance type it in. Go to the Pure Bible Search software webpage, purebiblesearch.com, download it, Windows, Linux, Mac, work on all three platforms. Just type in the phrase, the end. I guarantee you, you will be amazed at what you find related to that phrase. These are the words that he used, and I believe that because the Bible's translated in three unknown tongues, Hebrew, Aramaic, in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. You and I don't know those languages. And I guarantee you, most of the pastors who went to Bible college and or seminary, they don't know those languages either. They consult concordances and Greek lexicons and things like that to look up words. And they even do what I used to do years ago, try to find some obscure meaning of that word that's nowhere near what's in the Bible to make people think that I'm the only one who knows what the Bible really says. They have to get it from me if they're going to get it. I did that on purpose. Of course, my wife was going, would you cut that stuff out? Anyway, just type in the phrase, the end, and I believe that with the one interpretation of the King James of all three of those languages, what God has done is his, he has solidified, codified. He has standardized these words and phrases in the Bible so that if you look at one in one place and look at that same phrase in many other places, God's going to throw all kinds of wisdom at you over that. Uh, just think of the phrase, all things. Can you think of a, a verse in the Bible that says, all things. I'll give you one. The end of all things is at hand. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. So you just take that phrase, all things, and look at it all through the Bible. You might have to turn your TV off because it'll really invade your TV time. I guarantee you. But I promise you the knowledge, the understanding, and the wisdom that you will gain from that will be far worth the sacrifice of turning the TV and the internet off for a few hours. I guarantee it. So anyway, the end. We'll look at that phrase in a minute. Um, 
All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. That, that's actually in the Old Testament. We'll see it. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now, we're not going to deal with that today. But let's deal with uh, these couple things here. Verse 6, you shall hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. We're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with wars and rumors of wars. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So we're going to deal with those particular things uh, in today's study. Let's get to it. Uh, he says, again, Matthew 24, verse 6, See that you be not troubled. Mark 13, of course, is the companion to Matthew 24. And here's how Mark says it. Very similar. Uh, verse 7, And then ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end, there it is, that phrase, the end, shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of the sorrows. Now, when he says the end, we know that he's not talking about the end of the heavens and the earth, whereby they're going to be melted up with a fervent heat. We know he's not talking about that. He's talking about the end of this current um, era, this current aeon, this current epoch, this current world system and world way. There is going to be an end to how things are going now. There is going to be the rise of the Antichrist and his 42-month reign. And then there is going to be the great and glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, Revelation 19, he's coming down. Uh, to rule all nations with a rod of iron and establish a thousand year reign. Then after that is basically the end of everything when God shall melt everything away with a fervent heat. But the way things are going now in this particular world or this particular era or epoch, some would say dispensation, that's all coming to an end. But he says, when you see all these wars, that's not the end. There are some things that are going to happen before the end. And we'll look at that a little bit later on. So he says, be not troubled. Now, that phrase is also mentioned in several places in the Bible. Again, it's like God says, be, be of courage, be of good cheer. Let not your heart be troubled, and so on and so on. God wants us, even though we're going to see these things, I believe that. You may disagree. You may have some other view of this. That's fine. I would honor your disagreement. You have a right to disagree with me. I don't have a right to, for everybody to believe anything that I'm saying. But I definitely see the number of times where God says, you know, things are going to happen. And when they happen, I don't want my people to be troubled in thinking that maybe God left them or God abandoned them or God doesn't care about them or God doesn't love them or God wants them destroyed by the devil. I don't think God wants that. I think God just wants us, when we see certain things happening, for us to not be troubled. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 or chapter 1. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. The Bible says, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Let me stop right here. Now remember what I said last week, and I still stand by it. When I say the word tribulation, don't think that I'm talking about a seven-year period. Because I don't believe that it's that long. Okay, and again, 
I would encourage you to give me two witnesses from the Bible or three. I'll accept two. I might even accept one that says the tribulation is seven years. Okay. So when I say tribulation, don't assume that I mean a seven year period because I don't believe that anymore. I don't. All right. Anyway, back to the scriptures. Um, seeing it is righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and to you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So you see that he's putting this in the context of the Lord being revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. If you keep reading, if you did your study in Matthew 24, you know that there comes a point in Matthew 24 in which Jesus sends out his angels to gather together his elect. Then shall the sign of the Son of Man be revealed, he said. So I think that what he's saying here in 2 Thessalonians 1 is a direct connection to what he's saying in Matthew 24. The Lord's going to be revealed from heaven and his mighty angels are going to be seen with him. Verse 8, in flaming fire. Stop right here. Flaming fire. If you look at and do a study of 1 Peter, it's five chapters there, and all of it deals with a trial by fire. And it's not the trying of our works, because we're not saved by works. We're not judged by our works. It's a trial of our faith, the fiery trial which is to try you, he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. So I believe when he says here in flaming fire, that that is a reference to the fiery trial that is coming to this earth. And yes, I do believe that God's saints his believers, the ones who believe every word of God is pure, that the fiery trial is there to try their faith. Again, I don't believe that we're judged by our works. I think we're judged by our faith. Our faith is going to be put on trial. And a faith not worth dying for is not worth living for. And a faith that doesn't even last when things are going well certainly won't survive when things are on fire. And there is a fiery trial which is to try you. Okay, so I think all of that connects. I think it all matches together. Verse 8, but in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come, there it is, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So he mentions here when he says to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And then he says, um, that Christ is coming, verse 10, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired, admired in all them that believe. I believe that that is a reference to the translation, us being caught up or the rapture. That's what I believe. I believe it's going to be troubling times before we're raptured. And again, I don't believe that that's going to be a seven year period. I don't believe that it's even going to be a three and a half year period. There are other time prophecies given to us in the scriptures that I think better fit the times that we are 
going to go through. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, one chapter over. Here's what Paul said. And this, to me, really was the place in the Bible that changed my mind about what I believed about Bible prophecy or what I believed about the events surrounding the rapture. Remember, I used to believe that the rapture was the first event. Nothing happens before the rapture and everything else happens after the rapture. So all of this stuff in the Bible where it talks about tribulation and it talks about this and talks about, according to that idea, we don't have to worry about it. We don't even have to study it if we don't want to because it's not going to happen to us. And I've changed my viewpoint since then. I've changed what I believe about that. And it's based upon 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at what it says. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that's the translation, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. That is the same thing that Jesus said in Matthew 24, 6, see that you be not troubled. Mark chapter 13, verse 7, that you be not troubled. And he says it here. Verse 22 of 2 Thessalonians, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit. And spirits will trouble you. I've experienced it many times. Oh, they'll eat you up sometimes. Neither by spirit, nor by word. Words trouble me sometimes. Or by letter, as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. So God's telling us to not be troubled, neither by spirit, don't let spirits trouble you. And I think that during this time, God will equip us so that we're not troubled by these spirits nor by word, because when you start hearing of wars and rumors of wars coming all around you, that can be troubling. I mean, we are many years removed from World War II, days when American families were not looking forward to the day when an army vehicle pulled up to their house and an army officer and a chaplain got out to inform that family that their son had been killed in battle. A lot of families went through that. No one looked forward to it. Okay? Very troubling times happened during World War II. Same during the Korean War. Same during Vietnam War. The same with the Gulf Wars and things that go on in the Middle East. No one looks forward to the day when an army officer and a chaplain come by their house to tell them that somebody, their loved one, their husband, their daddy, their son got killed in a war. So wars definitely bring the idea of trouble. And yet God doesn't, I believe God will put a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind in us so that we are not troubled on that day. Uh, troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us is at the day of Christ's hand, because he specifically says that the man of sin, there's going to be a falling away, and the man of sin, the son of perdition, be revealed. So I believe, according to scriptures, that before we are translated up and caught up to be with the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord, I believe that we're going to see the falling away and the revelation of the man of sin. Right now, we don't know who it is. We don't. Anybody says you may know? I think they're either misled 
or they're deliberately lying, one way or the other. Right now, I don't believe we know, but I think we'll know before we leave this world. First Peter chapter three, look at this. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Look at there. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So he mentions here in this context to always be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And if we go back to Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, we can clearly see that when we hear the wars and the rumors of wars and the famines and pestilences and the earthquakes in diverse places, and he said, the end is not yet because the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached and they're going to come and get you and bring you before synagogues and bring you before rulers. And he tells us to think not in advance of what we're going to say because the Holy Ghost is going to give us the words that they will neither be able to gainsay nor resist. That's what he says here. Be ready to give an answer. And I think the Holy Ghost is going to give us the things to say to those people. I've experienced that before. Witnessing to an old longtime friend of mine that I grew up in church with and he backed away from the Lord, got off into sin and God laid it on my heart to go see him one night. And I was witnessing to him and getting nowhere with him. And finally, he got up, he had to go to the restroom, and I prayed, God, give me something to say to him that he'll be able to go. I can't argue with that. Sure enough, he comes back. I'm talking to him five minutes, and all of a sudden, boom, I hit him with something that I don't remember what it was, and he went. I can't argue with that. So I've seen it happen. I know it works. I've seen it happen. And I believe that God has called us, if we are going to be that generation that lives in that day, I mean, didn't God call us to preach the gospel to every living creature? Did he not call us in this world to tell others about Jesus and to witness to them? Why not wait here until we have finished the work that God has given us to do. That is to preach the gospel to every living creature. And before we leave out of here, our mission has to be complete. And I dare say it's not complete yet. Because if it was complete, we would be gone. So, and I thought about this years ago. I said, you know, God, you put me down here to preach the gospel. Right now, a lot of people don't listen. But what if God, what if absolute just hell breaks loose on this earth? Maybe then some people will listen to the gospel. I want that more than I want anything in this world. To be able to preach the gospel one last time before God just pours out his wrath on this earth. God called me to preach the gospel. And I want to be able to preach the gospel to as many people as I can. So I've always had this scenario in my mind. What if, what if we heard that there was some biological attack and downtown St. Louis and they quarantined off the area and they won't let anybody in. They won't let anybody out. Where would I be on that day? Would I be going, oh, I'm glad I'm not down there. And I thought about it and I've said to myself, God, 
if such an event like that ever happens, even similar to that, I want to be where the people are in the most danger so I can preach the gospel to them. Maybe they'll get saved. That's where my heart is. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for the way of escape to get out of here as quickly as possible. God's called me to preach the gospel. And I don't want to leave here until I've preached it to everybody that God has for me to preach it to. Then I'll say, God, it's okay to, it's okay to take me now. Now, skip back to this phrase back in Matthew 24. And he tells us to be not troubled. And I do believe that when the time's right, our hearts will not be troubled. I don't think we'll have fear like we have now. I don't think we'll have it then. Well, let's go back and look at that phrase. The end is not yet. He says it in Matthew 24, 6. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Matthew 24, 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And then Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Now, I just happen to know why some people say that Matthew 24 is not for us. That's for Israel. And believe it or not, it has a lot to do with this phrase, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And I'm going to drop something on you that you may find unbelievable. But, the, and I've read their stuff. The reason why they say that this can't be for us is that this must be for Israel because Israel has to endure to the end. We don't. I want you to examine that thought for a minute. Because I've heard that in funerals, I've heard that with people. We don't have to endure. We're automatically saved by grace, even if we endure or don't endure. I've even heard, and I know that not everybody who would believe in everlasting salvation believes this, but I've heard my share of people who do, who say, bless God, I believe that I can believe in Jesus for one day and be saved for eternity and never lose my salvation, no matter what I do, no matter how far away from God I stray the rest of my life. That's called tempting the Lord your God. One pastor even saying, I believe I could take the mark of the beast and still be saved. But I don't even believe you have to repent to be saved. That's work salvation. You know, people who say that that you don't have to repent, usually don't. They don't repent of anything. Statements like that, they're not from Scripture, I guarantee you. They're not from Scripture. So that's why a lot of people look at this and say, that's not for us, that's for Israel. Israel has to endure. We don't. And to me, and I've, we've seen it, and a lot of churches who believe that, the corruption that exists in those churches is absolutely rampant among every group who believes that we don't have to endure. We don't have to continuously act like Christians all the time. We can go out and be atheist, lesbian, homosexual witches and still go to heaven. I think places where that idea abounds, there is so much corruption and sin there, hidden in closets. On the outside, they look righteous. On the outside, they look decent. And all the men have very, very short hair and all the women wear long dresses. 
and on the outside they put on a very, very good show, but inwardly they are very corrupt. And because they believe they don't have to repent, usually they don't. And I'm against that. I, I absolutely am. And you can call me work salvation all you want to. But I believe the endurance unto the end that's called for as Christians is not an endurance of works. It's an endurance of faith. Faith. I have verses to show you. So he says, the end is not yet. Matthew 24, 13, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world and to all nations, and then shall the end come. And I believe he's talking about the end of this particular era in advance of the thousand-year reign and the rise of the Antichrist for a little space and so on at the beginning of that. So let's look at that phrase, the end, various places. We'll just, we'll restrict it to the New Testament, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, look at this. So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto when? The end. That you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So a couple things here. The day of our Lord Jesus Christ refers to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to appear in the air. He's going to be revealed from heaven. We're going to go, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. Oh, look, here comes the dead in Christ. We're going to follow them. We're going to be transformed and follow them. Okay, that day is coming. I can't, oh, I can't wait for it. I have to, but I'd rather not. Amen? And the purpose of that is... He's going to confirm us to the end that we may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the truth of it is we still inhabit this nasty, nasty flesh body. The spirit truly is willing. The flesh is very weak. Paul said, the things that I would do, I, I don't know how to do. The things that I don't want to do... I, I do them. Oh, wretched man that I am. But I believe there's coming a time when God is literally going to purge out of all of us believers all the sins that do easily beset us. He's going to purge them all out so that we can bear much fruit for the kingdom of heaven. That's what I believe. 1 Corinthians 15, this is, there's a, boy, there's a lot in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 gives us the exact description of the gospel, that it's belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It also speaks of the translation, the rapture. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, and so on. But he says, sandwiched in the middle of those two ideas, he says this in verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. That would be us. Then cometh the end. When he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, we know that death itself is the last enemy. He says it here. And if you look in the book of Revelation, we know that death itself is not destroyed until after the 1,000-year reign of Christ. Because that's when death and hell are cast into the lake of fire to be destroyed forever. That then being the last of our enemies. But well, that's not going to happen till after the thousand year reign of Christ. So if you look at this, he says, first Christ, the first fruits, 
afterward, they that are Christ that is coming, which I believe is us, then cometh the end. Now, the end is, I think, a pretty long period of time. And it involves the, the process of events that take place to bring about the very end of things, if that makes sense to you. In other words, the end is not all just in one 12 hour period. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. We talked about that last time and a thousand years is as one day. So when we talk about the day of the Lord, we're talking about number one, a 24 hour period. I believe that, but also a 1000 year period. 24 hour period, then a 1000 year period, if I said that right. Uh, and both of them apply. And there are things that God is going to do that Christ is going to do during that time to bring about the absolute end of everything. There is like the beginning of the end and the end of the end and all the things that Christ is going to do during that time. Then cometh the end, verse 24, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign till he hath put all, and that's what he's going to do during the thousand years, till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. The Lord shall make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable. Establish means to stick it in one place, to establish it. Establish, establish, same idea. In other words, it's fixed and not movable. That he, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So I believe there, again, there's, this speaks of a time where Christ is going to make us unblameable, unreprovable, uh, no one being able to lay against us the charges of any sin whatsoever. Hebrews chapter three, verse five, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. You see, let me kind of tell you what I think is going to happen. We know there's a lot of churches around, a lot of churches around. And we know that a lot of those churches really are playing with apostasy. And they're playing a lot with it. And I believe that at some point it's going to be known among all the religious Christian quote unquote organizations around the world who really do stick with Jesus and who is not going to stick with Jesus. I think it's going to be known on that day. And I think there's going to be some people who sit in church pews who are not going to hold fast and hold firm the confidence firm unto the end. I, I believe they're going to give up. Remember the parable of the seed and the sower. The seed falls upon stony ground and oh, with joy, it, it springs up, right? Oh, that looks great. You're, you're, you must be a Christian. But when temptation, tribulation riseth, they are offended for the word's sake. All of a sudden now they find something in the Bible that doesn't, they don't agree with. And they reject it because they are sown on stony ground. They endure for a while. 
that when tribulation, persecution ariseth, they're gone. Produce no fruit. Therefore, ye shall know them by their fruits or the lack thereof. So I think there's coming a time when Satan is going to sift us as wheat. But that's okay, because if you really are a child of the living God, God's going to make sure you, end you endure firm to the end. It won't, again, it won't be based upon any of the works that you do. It's going to be based upon the work that God did. And if God means for you to endure until the end, He is going to give you the strength to endure until the end. He's going to make sure of it, in other words. Mm, I love this. Hebrews 3.12, same chapter, different verse. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Remember, we're going to be judged by our faith or lack of faith. Belief or unbelief. Just like, and, and this is a reference, Hebrews 3 is a reference to the day that they sent the 12 spies into Canaan land, 40 days later, they came back and said, 10 of them said, we can't go in there. There's no way in the world. They'll kill us all. We, we, we're not going in there. We're just, we're just not going. That's it. Because we don't want to die. Joshua and Caleb, because they had a different spirit in them, said, uh, excuse me, God said we're going to eat them for breakfast. I don't know what giants taste like, but apparently they taste like bacon and eggs. So we're going to go in there and eat them for breakfast and bagels. They taste like bagels. We're going to go and, and destroy them. Why don't we go in? Because a different spirit was in them than was in the rest of them. And they could not enter in because of their unbelief. They departed from the living God and did not remain firm unto the end. So he says, verse 13 of Hebrews 3, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And that phrase confidence has the word faith in it. Con means with fide, fidelity, faith. If we hold the beginning of our confidence, our faith, steadfast to the end. If you'll just, no matter what you see, no matter what happens to the world, no matter how much persecution comes, you say, you know what? I still believe what God said. I still believe. And lots of people in the last 2,000 years have endured incredible persecution. And they all said, we still believe what God said. I've been tested that way before. Things where my emotions really got the best of me. And at one point I said, I'm not sure that I believe that this book is right. And my wife said to me, Mike, you know you do. She was right. And I couldn't understand why I was going through what I was going through, but now I understand. It was a test. It was a trial of my faith. And at the end of that day, I said, God, I still believe what you promised. I still trust you. God's been blessing me every day since then. So I believe that before the end comes, we will be tested. We will be tried. And God knows already who's going to hold fast to the end. He's going to equip them. He's going to give them, fill them with his strength and his courage so that relying upon God during those days, it'll be the easiest thing we've ever done. And it'll be worth it. 1 Peter 1, verse 7. Again, here we are back in 1 Peter. Five chapters 
full of persecution, suffering, fiery trial, the trial of our faith. First Peter 1, verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing, there it is, the appearing of, our Je of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving, here it is, the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So let me tell you what I absolutely believe in. It's not, you know, Chris Pinto said it one way, uh, another pastor, a friend of mine said it another, but I like what they said. Because the, the question came up, you know, do you believe in once saved, always saved? And Chris Pinto said, I believe if saved, always saved. And another pastor friend of mine said, he calls it once prayed, always saved. He doesn't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe that if you're truly saved, God knows it. God knows it. And he, and I believe that preservation and perseverance go hand in hand. The evidence that God preserves us is that we persevere in faith, not works, faith, firm unto the end, so that there is no question. If I die, I don't want there to be any question among anybody who knew me, who really knew me, well, maybe he's in heaven. I don't want there to be any doubt. You know, Mike Hoggard was a lot of things and he was wrong. I disagreed with him on some things, but I know one thing about him. He believed that Bible until the day he died. That's all I want. It's all I want said about me. He believed what God said with his last breath, he believed what God said. So, the end of your faith, the end of your faith, if you're truly saved, the end of your faith will coincide with the end of God's work in your life. And you endured to the end and you were found faithful to the very end. That's the salvation of your souls. When you finally die and receive the salvation that you asked for on the day you asked Jesus into your heart to save you, you remained faithful and steadfast unto the very end. You endured to the end. You were faithful to the very end. And you received the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. First Peter 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, in hope, for how long? To the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you at, look at, there it is, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you know what the first words of the book of Revelation are? The first words, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God hath gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified by his angel unto the servant John. I love that verse. Hope all the way to the end. We're saved by hope, right? So if you're saved by hope and you only have hope like for one day or a, like one week and then the devil talks you out of it for the rest of your life, can it be said that you were saved? I don't believe so. I believe those who are truly saved God preserves them in faith 
steadfast to the very end. It's not that, well, he got saved when he was sick, so yeah, he was the drunk, he was the town drunk and the town meth dealer and the town sodomite and the town witch and the town murderer and you know, the prison sentence and yeah, all of that. But he got saved when he was a little boy. I don't think that's salvation. I really don't. First uh, Peter 1 13, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you unto the revelation of Jesus Christ. First Peter 4 Verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? In verse 18, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Judgment's going to begin at the house of God. And if the righteous scarce will be saved, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So you see, when Jesus said that, you know, you're going to hear wars and rumors, words, but the end is not yet. There are going to be some things that happen. But I go back to Matthew 24 and what he said, but he that shall endure to the end, not endure in works, in faith, the same shall be saved. Amen. Now, Revelation 2, verse 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. Now here's an interesting thing. What he says here, we know that Jesus is going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. We know that. But he says here, to the one who overcomes, endures to the end, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. We know that when Jesus comes in Revelation 19, riding back on a white horse, that the, he's coming with the ten thousands of his saints who are going to rule and reign with him over all the nations of the earth for a thousand years. There's a, there's a typological prophetic picture of that back in the Old Testament with Moses, whom Jethro told him, Moses, it, it ain't right. You sit here all day judging every puny little matter. Why don't you appoint rulers over thousands, thousand, thousand year reign, and rulers over hundreds, and rulers over fifties, and rulers over tens. Why don't you appoint sub-rulers so that they can judge small matters, and if that needs to be taken to a higher court, it can be, then the rulers over thousands can judge it, and if they still can't figure it out, then it can come to you because you're the ultimate judge. Now, all that was a was sort of a foreshadowing of Christ who brings us back with him in glorified bodies, that way we can't be tempted with money, we can't be tempted with women, we can't be tempted with food, because we won't need it. And we'll judge righteous judgment over the nations. So he says, to him that overcometh, keepeth my works unto the end, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, right? So in Revelation 12, remember there's a woman in heaven and she's travailing in birth. She's going to give birth to a man child. Look at what it says. Revelation 12, 5, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. 
So, this child that's born of the woman from heaven, I believe that's Jerusalem above, which is free, which is the mother of us all. It is her who we receive our second birth from. God, of course, is our father, the father of our second birth. But the mother of our second birth is Jerusalem above, which is free. And I believe that's who that woman is. And she gives birth to the man-child, which I do believe is Christ, but we're the body of his second coming, aren't we? We're going to be with the Lord, meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And by the way, it says, you know, the, the dragon's ready to devour that child as soon as it's born. And so when it's born, her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. That's the same phrase used in 1 Thessalonians 14. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Okay, you see the connection here? I, I do. All right, so um, he's telling us that that's what the end, I believe, represents. And I believe that God is going to allow us to endure to the end. He's going to allow us to endure through all these wars and commotions and wars and rumors of wars. So let's spend a little while longer examining these wars. I said this last week, there's been wars for the last 2000 years. And I'm sure those who saw the events of World War I might have said, oh, there's wars. That must be the coming of the Lord. Same thing, World War II. Oh, this, there's wars everywhere. This must be the coming of the Lord. Well, it didn't happen. Maybe then Korea War, maybe the Vietnam War, maybe, I don't know. There was wars and been wars for thousands of years. The Lord hasn't come. But I definitely think that prior to the coming of the Lord, there is going to be such a massive increase of wars. And maybe, just maybe, not all of those wars originate here on the earth. Just maybe. Let's look at the scriptures. Luke 21, uh, Jesus in Matthew 24 said wars and rumors of wars. Mark said wars and rumors of wars. Luke says something slightly different. He says in 21 verse 9, But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Notice in, he mentions commotions, and there's, that word's very, very, very scant in the Bible. But one of the places it's found is in Jeremiah 10, verse 22. Behold, the noise of the brute is come, and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. Now, remember, we, we just got done with a series dealing with these Nordic meaning from the north, aliens. We established the idea that all throughout the Bible, the north seems to indicate a place where God comes from and any devils or angels, they also come out of the north. So the, the northern army that is mentioned in the book of Joel and the nations of the north and the kingdoms of the north and the army of the north is not an army of Scandinavians or people from Iceland or Greenland or people from Canada or northern Siberia. I think that it's an army that comes from 
wherever God came from when he came from the north in Ezekiel chapter 1. I think it's an army of devils because he says the noise of the brute is come in Jeremiah 10, 22. Do you know what the brute is? It's like what Peter said describing the false prophets. These as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. So the brute are beasts and not just like this is not going to be the war of the planet of the apes. This is going to be wars fought by spirits. And in that, then we bring in something we've looked at millions of times. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 predicts a time of war coming. But it's a war that's not fought from one group of humans to another group of humans. It is, verse 11, Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. A lot of people ask me the question, Pastor, should we stockpile guns and ammunition? Well, you know, clearly right now with all the looting and the Antifa rioting and the Antifa trying to start skirmishes everywhere across the country, people have been very afraid that these terrorists are going to lead these commotions down into the residential areas where people live. And at least one sheriff of a county in Florida came out and said, you know, hey, we hear that you're about ready to move into our county and this is not, you know, there's not a city here. There's just a lot of residential areas. Well, we're telling you right now that we know these people. Almost all of them have guns, and they have a lot of them in their house with a lot of ammunition. And we're here to tell you right now that we're going to give them all permission that if they feel threatened in their own homes by rioters and looters and people who would burn their house down, that if they feel threatened, they have guns, and we say use them. A man has a right to defend his castle. In Missouri, where we live, there's a castle law that says a man's home is his castle, and he has a right to defend his castle. So if someone comes kicking my door at 3 o'clock in the morning, I know they're not there to sell me a vacuum cleaner. And I have a right to defend my home, my property, and defend whoever is staying in my home at the time, even with deadly force. So, we can do that in America, and it's the right thing to do. But I think there's wars coming. You can't shoot bullets at devils. You'll never hit them. It won't affect them anyway. So, the weapons of our warfare in that war are not carnal. They're spiritual. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers ru against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So is it possible that the wars and rumors of wars that take place at this time won't even be wars related to human beings? So you know, it, I, I would say it doesn't hurt to have as many guns as you can get a hold of and as much ammunition as, as you can get a hold of. My pastor friend, Reg Kelly, he even attempted at one time during the Obama administration to manufacture bullets. But it was during the Obama administration. He couldn't even find brass to do it. He had a company he contracted to buy purchase brass to make bullets 
they canceled the contract and said, we don't have any brass for you. And the rumor was they sold it all to China. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Well, it's possible that if the wars and rumors of wars that we hear about in Matthew 24, if, if I'm seeing what I'm seeing in the scriptures correctly, we won't need the bullets anyway. What we'll need is our sword, which is the Word of God, which has an endless supply of weapons in it. Never run out. It's like having a, you know, a phaser from Buck Rogers or Star Trek that we just keep shooting and shooting and shooting and we never run out, never run out of ammunition. Amen? That's what we believe as Bible-believing Christians. We'll look at some of these wars. We'll look at some of the verses related to the wars. And oddly enough, in some of these verses, it reiterates what Jesus said. Be not troubled. Be not troubled. These wars, they're going to come. God says, be not troubled. Because you have to ask yourself the question, what if they do kill us during that time? Are you worried about that? If you're worried about that, maybe you should remember that at the end of your life as a Christian, what do you have after that? Everlasting life. We're not going to lose, no matter what. Now to my brothers who believe that the rapture comes first, that's great. If it's gonna happen that way, then we definitely don't have anything to worry about. But even if it doesn't, we still have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. Because when we lose this life, we gain everlasting life. Or else, why are we even trying to be Christians? Amen? Amen. So we'll look at these wars next week. I am actually enjoying this study and the things that I'm learning myself about Matthew 24 that I never really knew before. I'm enjoying the study. Man, it's been a long time in coming to, to have the joy of pulling these things out of the Word of God. I hope you're enjoying it as well. And even if you don't agree with everything I say, at least let me, with the scriptures that I present, provoke you to go to the scriptures yourself to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. All right? This is Pastor Mike. You are the reason why we do what we do. May the Lord bless you. Pray for our ministry. Pray for our work in Kenya, that God would continue to use us there as well as around the world. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.